Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to our webinar um, spotlight on psoriasis and COVID-19. My name is Antonella Scali, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Psoriasis Network. We're very happy to have you here tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know our network, um, just to give you some background, we are a patient-led uh, nonprofit organization um, with a focus on enhancing the quality of life of people and families affected by psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in Canada. And we do that in part by sharing um, information on research and treatments and uh, other important information to our community. Um, and by building advocacy and awareness around the complexities of this condition through events like this one. So um, we're a member-based organization. Uh, if you're not a member yet, we invite you to our uh, website at cpn-rcp.com. Uh, membership is free and uh, we will um, be able to share information about events like this going forward uh, if you do join us. Um, just before we dive into the topic of the evening, I wanted to uh, remind uh, everyone that the session tonight will be recorded in English and French. So our English participants have been muted for the duration of the session. And we ask that our French participants, please put yourselves, uh, your phone on mute and, and your computers on mute for uh, the duration of the session. There, there will be a question and answer period at the end. Um, so throughout the event, you're welcome to um, add a question in the chat box on the right hand corner um, and we'll be opening up uh, and, and allowing you to mute yourselves on the French line for questions uh, at that point. Um, so, so just to, to dive right in, um, tonight's uh, session is actually um, the first of a series that we're doing um, over fall. So. We are um, starting off with psoriasis and COVID-19, um, and in October, we're going to be taking a deep dive into psoriasis and diet, uh, another issue that's largely important to our community. Um, and we'll have a dermatologist, Dr. Irina Turchin, presenting on psoriasis, and then a deep dive by registered dietitian, Sandra Seville. Um, and then in November, we're looking at another important area of focus, um, psoriasis and mental health with Dr. Uh, dermatologist Dr. Alwalia, providing an uh, overview of psoriasis and social worker Leslie Ann Molnar uh, taking a deep dive into um, the interplay between psoriasis and mental health. So if you haven't signed up already, we wanted to share this with you uh, and let you know that you can sign up um, at cpn-rcp.com for these ones as well, as well. We're really looking forward to them. Um, but tonight we're taking, um, we're going to get right into our, our area of focus. Um, we, Needless to say, the last several months have been uh, extremely trying for just about everybody and for people who live with chronic conditions like psoriasis and, and related comorbidities. Um, there are unique worries and concerns and, and questions that uh, our community has, which is why we wanted to start off our series with this with this event um, to get a lay of the land uh, as to what um, the, the current state of knowledge is uh, on this topic. So before we dive right into that, um, I just wanted to let you know that on our website, we do have uh, links to um, resources that we as an organization follow. Um, I, as you all know, the situation around COVID-19 continues to evolve. Um, so these are some of the resources that we follow. Um, and, and just to bring your attention to the last one, we do have an ongoing survey open um, that you can access on our site that invites you to ask any questions that you may have uh, as, we, as we go through the pandemic. We would do our best to direct you to um, good information to, to help support you and or, or to try to get your question answered. Um, so, and, and again, the situation is evolving and, and this is all general information, including the information that we'll be hearing tonight. So uh, for any individual questions or, or concerns, we always, of course, encourage our community to, to work with your dermatologist and your care team uh, for any questions uh, or advice that you need. Um, so just to, to get to our, uh, our actual presentation tonight, I, I thank you for, again, for joining us. and. Uh, I'm very excited to turn it over to our, our guest speakers. Um, so because CPN had been hearing so much about people, um, you know, having questions about risk and um, 
concerns uh, about out potential elevated risk to COVID-19. Um, we heard a lot of questions about treatments and, um, you know, disruptions to treatments. We know every, so, so many um, disruptions have happened in school and work and, and maybe in uh, access to people's uh, regular um, drug insurance. So, th so this has been an important topic to us for a long time. So, we asked Dr. Kirchhoff to um, provide a current uh, state of knowledge on some of those key questions. So, what you know, what are the risks for people with psoriasis um, that, we, as we know right now, um, what are some of the things to keep in mind in terms of treatment, uh, and what does the research say about treatment as of now, and what do we have to think about going forward, um, especially as we go into the fall and as we're looking at vaccines. Um, so, we're very grateful um, to have Dr. Kirchhoff start us off, and then we. We have, uh, we're grateful to have our member Laura Catalano um, to share her perspectives from a, from a patient's position because she's been living these things and these questions and she's willing to share with us um, how she's managing them. Um, so we get to learn from her as well uh, in terms of some, some tips and ideas for, for getting through. So without further ado, uh, I do want to introduce our, our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Kirchhoff, and, and hand this over to him. Um, Dr. Kirchhoff, just for some background, is uh, the Division Head of Dermatology in the fac Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital. After receiving his Bachelor of Science in Molecular Biology from McMaster University, Dr. Kirchhoff completed his medical degree and PhD at Western University in London, Ontario. His PhD research involved studies of the signaling pathways important to immune system regulation. He then went on to complete his dermatology residency at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC. Until August 2017, Dr. Kirchhoff was the Education Director at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where he coordinated and led undergraduate, postgraduate, and continuing medical education activities. He's published over 50 peer-reviewed papers and maintains a keen interest in clinical and beach-to-bedside research. He has been invited to speak at local, national, and international meetings. His clinical interests are varied, and he sees both pediatric and adult patients. Dr. Kirchhoff was recently awarded the Teaching Award by the Dermatology Residents at the University of Ottawa. He develops and provides the Basic Science Lecture Series for residents in addition to weekly clinical teaching in the clinic and on call in the hospital. He is also an examiner for the Royal College Dermatology Exam and a board member of the Canadian Dermatology Association. So we are very thankful to Dr. Kirchhoff for joining us this evening and making time to help us get through the research uh, and, and get us up to speed on, on things with COVID-19 and psoriasis. Thank you, Dr. Kirchhoff. Great, thank you for the introduction. I'm just gonna make sure that everybody can, you can see my slides? And you can yes. see them changing? Yes, okay, great. Looks like it. I always wanna make sure there's a, a check at the beginning before we dive right in. You don't wanna get 10 slides in and people say they can't see your slides. All right, so I've been asked to speak to you tonight about COVID-19 and psoriasis, the risks, the benefit, and the future. You might say, why benefits? Well, we're going get, to get to that in a second. These are my uh, disclosures. I have been a speaker uh, for several companies, um, and I have provided consulting uh, services for several companies as well. I'm an employee of the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital. So the objectives for tonight uh, uh, is a dive into what the evidence says about the risk of contracting COVID-19 for people with psoriasis, the risk to people with psoriasis uh, who are infected with COVID-19, uh, how have treatment plans been affected by COVID-19? Uh, and what do we see going forward in terms of psoriasis patients, COVID-19, and generally for society? On the agenda, I'm going to give you a quick update on the status of COVID-19 in Canada. Uh, that's already changed. Uh, when I submitted this presentation about a week and a bit ago, uh, things, have, has, as you've seen already in the news, have changed rapidly. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the immunopathogenesis of COVID-19. I'm going to review some data, and some of this will be somewhat heavy in data, but I think I'll try to explain it in, in terms that will be understandable, um, because I do think reviewing the data is important. So looking at the data to estimate the risks to patients who are on treatment uh, for their psoriasis, looking at a quick overview of the treatments that are being evaluated for COVID-19, some of the real world or registry data that has been collected since the pandemic started, and then we'll examine some vaccination information. So. There are, as you know, many vaccines that are in development. The question is, how will that affect you, specifically if you are on treatment? So we'll start by introducing COVID-19. 
So COVID-19 is the name of the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is the actual name of the virus that causes the disease. It belongs to this coronavirus family. And we know the coronavirus family can infect uh, people. There are seven known coronaviruses to infect human beings. Four of those um, uh, are quite common and typically associated with very mild disease, very similar to the common cold. And then three of them uh, have caused more significant disease. And so one of those is uh, SARS-CoV-1, if you will, or severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome coronavirus. And the other one is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And then, of course, the most recent is the SARS-CoV-2, um, which is believed to have originated in bats. In fact, all three of those originated in bats, as you can see here. So the bat is believed to be the originator for uh, MERS, SARS-CoV-1, and SARS-CoV-2. There was then an intermediate host. And for SARS-CoV-2, we believe it's the pangolin. And then uh, uh, there was transfer to humans. Um, and then there's been human to human spread since that. We know this originated in China, in the Huan province, uh, and has now um, uh, circumnavigated the entire globe. And so, as mentioned, this presentation was submitted um, about uh, 11 days ago, 12 days ago. Um, so here you can see this is updated in uh, on the 1st of September. At that point in time, there were about 25.5 million cases of uh, COVID-19. Um, that has now increased to close to 30 million in the past week or so. Um, and there's also an increase in the number of deaths. When we look at Canada specifically, and remember this data is from a little while ago, um, you can see that the majority of cases are in Ontario and Quebec. The Atlantic provinces have created a bubble uh, and have tried to maintain their numbers and they haven't had very many new cases at all. We are now starting to see increases in parts of Canada. And some people have talked of this as being the second wave, but in particular, in British Columbia, as you can see right here, uh, and in Alberta, uh, there is a sharp uptick in the numbers. And so we're seeing more and more cases. The same has now happened in Ontario and Quebec. And so many people believe that with the start of school and people going indoors, we're gonna see a, a sharp increase in the number of uh, COVID-19 cases, so-called the second wave. And this is based partially on some of the data we have from the Spanish flu. So that was the big pandemic that occurred a little bit over 100 years ago. As we look at what happened with the Spanish flu, there was an initial peak uh, that was uh, early in the spring. And then there was summer that took place. And so it plateaued. And this is what we see right now. And then there was a second wave. Uh, and in the case of Spanish flu, the second wave was, was even higher than that first wave. It then subsided again, and then even had a third wave. Um, so we might be in for a couple more waves as we go along here. One thing we can learn from the Spanish flu data is that depending on your social distancing, you can avoid these large peaks. So this is a tale of two cities right here. Uh, so you can see uh, that uh, Philadelphia uh, as a solid line uh, did not social distance. And so you had this huge peak in cases while St. Louis, immediately as they found out that the Spanish flu was rampant, they closed down a lot of the social events, they forced people to separate, and they were able to flatten this curve. So really, the Spanish flu can inform us about what's going to potentially happen uh, with COVID-19. So what about risk stratification of patients? So if we go back to the original uh, cohort of patients from China, they did some analysis to find out what was uh, wrong or what made these patients worse. One of the things that came out of that was uh, an identification of inflammatory cytokines. So cytokines are molecules that float in our body um, and they cause and promote inflammation. And if you'll note here, they, they divided patients into healthy controls, patients who had COVID-19 who were in the ICU and patients who were not in the ICU. Obviously, the patients in the ICU were much more severe. And you'll note that uh, for here, IL-17, and over here for TNF-alpha, that the healthy controls had lower levels of these inflammatory cytokines. And when they had the disease, they had higher levels. And when they were in the ICU, they were even higher. So here's no ICU, so that's the average. And when they were in the ICU, it's up here. So there was definitely an elevation from here to here. So the worse your disease, the more inflammation you have. That becomes uh, um, important when looking at the uh, risk stratification of these patients. So 
Um, this is the death rate by age, health, sex, and comorbidities. So when they look at the overall mortality of COVID-19, they note that patients who are older have a much, much higher mortality rate. So that's one of the biggest risk factors. But if you have other conditions, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory disease, hypertension, this also increases your risk of death from COVID-19. And if you're a man, you have a higher mortality. So psoriasis has not been identified as a direct risk factor for COVID-19, but we know that patients who have psoriasis have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, which we know have a higher risk of mortality associated with COVID-19. And just to show you that right here, this is a study that looked at a control population, so healthy controls, patients who had mild psoriasis and patients who had severe psoriasis. And um, you'll note that uh, as the psoriasis worsens, they have more incidence of diabetes, hypertension, lipidemia, and obesity. All right, so there's elevations of all of those. And we know that all of these are risk factors for worse COVID-19 outcomes. So what about the immunopathogenesis? And this is gonna help uh, inform us about the risks associated with treatment for psoriasis. So just to go back uh, to a very basic understanding of the pathogenesis of uh, a respiratory illness, there are basically two major arms of the immune system and they're divided into the innate and the adaptive. And you can think of the innate as uh, a general defense against all bacteria and viruses. It doesn't care what type of virus or bacteria it really is. It's just gonna try to mount a defense to keep you alive for as long as possible, allowing the adaptive immune system to kick in. The adaptive immune system is very precise. It targets a specific virus, a specific bacteria, and it has lethal abilities to destroy those. Uh, so when we look down here at this graph, and this is time on the bottom here, uh, initially you have this rise in the innate immune system. So this is trying to keep you alive, but you'll notice that the viral load is still going up here. So the virus is in yellow, so it's increasing, even though you're trying to protect yourself with this innate immune system. Then later on, the adaptive immune system kicks in. And the main thing that you need to note from the adaptive immune system is the production of antibodies. The antibodies are important because of course, when we produce a vaccine, or we're trying, trying to produce antibodies. So this adaptive immune system then is able to quickly shut down viral replication and clear the infection. This is a specific uh, pathogenesis of COVID-19 uh, and the immunity that develops more precisely. So here's the virus. As you can see, this is a viral particle. There are these little proteins on the surface called spike proteins, and that's how the virus is entering the cell. This spike protein interacts with the ACE2 receptor. Then it goes inside the cell, as you can see right here. The, the genetic material of the virus is released and then is able to replicate, and so more viruses are produced. But while the cell is being infected, um, it releases an immune signal that tells the immune system to activate. Inflammation and the immune system kill the infected cells. The, uh, and the viral particles are then taken up by immune cells and eventually protective antibodies are produced and that will protect the host from future infection. We have immunological memory. So our immune system has a memory that remembers you were infected by a certain virus. So that when you see that virus again, it can protect you from that virus. So the next concept I'm gonna introduce is the idea of the cytokine storm. Um, so the cytokine storm is um, basically the idea that you um, have inflammation that causes a lot of the damage in this disease. So um, the more inflammation you have, the worse it is. So here's an uninfected individual, and this is the lung lining here, so pulmonary epithelium. Here's your immune cells, no symptoms. So this is hopefully most of the people in the audience. When you have moderate COVID-19, you have a little bit of inflammation, cytokine levels start to go up as we saw in that earlier paper I showed you, and then some cells start to die. But when you get very severe COVID-19, you get lots and lots and lots of these cytokines. It produces a cytokine storm. And this results in cellular damage. 
So here's a, a picture of the alveoli. So this is the air sac in your lung that exchanges oxygen. So in early stages, you're exchanging oxygen, no problem. You might get infection in the area, but you're still having a pretty good time. It's only later on that you start getting damaged. And so in this paper, what they stated uh, is that, that perhaps blocking some of those inflammatory cytokines, in particular, uh, TNF-alpha, um, IL-1 and IL-6, may be effective in stopping that process. So that gives us an idea about potential treatments for COVID-19. So in the early phase, we see that there's lots of virus, um, but then as the virus infects the cells, we start getting this pulmonary phase. The virus actually goes down a bit because your inflammation starts to go up. But unfortunately, as your inflammation keeps going higher and higher, you then can lead to hospitalization and worsening symptoms. So when we look at different treatment options along this pathway, the first thing ideally would be a vaccine. That stops this whole process before it even starts. There are antivirals and immune stimulation that can occur very on in, in very early on in the viral phase. But later on, what we need is anti-inflammatories. So these anti-inflammatories can block that inflammation that causes so much damage uh, to the lungs and to the host. So what about psoriasis treatments in the time of COVID-19? Well, this is a statement that was produced by the National uh, um, Psoriasis Foundation. So according to them, if a person is not taking immunosuppressive medication and is free from other underlying diseases, there may be a minimal risk um, uh, from SARS-CoV-2. However, if the virus is you know, very transmissible, spreads rapidly, there is a risk to everyone. Um, they note for patients who have very severe psoriasis, who are on immunosuppressive therapies, uh, or have other medical conditions, they are probably at a higher risk. Now, I'm gonna prove to you that one of those things is actually not true. So this is a list of treatments that we use for psoriasis in Canada, topicals, phototherapy, acetretin, we use a premolas, cyclosporin, methotrexate, biologics need to be classified as anti-TNF, anti-IL-1223, anti-IL-17, anti-IL-23. And these are just different flavors of biologics. So there was a lot of, of noise that initially came out when uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic started about whether or not we should be stopping patients. And so this was a paper, one of the early ones from Italy. And if you remember the pictures from Italy, they had a really tough time uh, um, coping with this pandemic and it caused a lot of uh, mortality and morbidity in that area. So these are Italian dermatologists and they wrote a paper that said COVID-19 in the time of psoriasis, is it time to limit treatment? And what they stated is that you should prefer topical agents, that you should stop all immunosuppressive and biologic therapy where exposure to confirmed COVID-19 occurs. There was an American paper, an American dermatologist who stated that TNFs carry a black box warning concerning for infection, that ustekinumab contains IL-1212 blocker, which may be important for viral infection blocking. There was another paper that indicated that there were several treatments that have likely concerning risks, so consider stopping. Uh, some of them had moderate risk, and uh, some of them even had higher risks, so concerning risks, so consider stopping when viral symptoms are present, or if you had unknown exposure, and so you can imagine unknown exposure qualifies for many people. So how do we assess the risk to patients from these treatments? We have now written and published a paper on this. Um, so I'm going to discuss a few different therapies and give you a quick overview and then a summary of the ideas that we have published. So the ideal way to assess the risk of a dermatological therapy is to run a placebo-controlled uh, blinded trial. So you basically take uh, several patients and you put some of them on the placebo and some of them on the treatment and then you expose them to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and then you measure the outcome. How many people are positive? How many people have disease severity? How many people uh, potentially might die? Now obviously this is not an ethical treatment uh, or ethical study um, and so we can't do this type of study but this would be the gold standard. So how do we assess and approximate the risk of COVID-19 to patients who are taking these medications? Well, one way I'm going to show you is by you looking at mouse data. If we destroy and knock out the targets that we are targeting with our therapy, what happens to those mice? 
Is there information on human knockout data? And then looking at some of the phase three placebo controlled trials and determining how many patients had serious infections, how many of them had upper respiratory tract infections when they were on the different treatments. And then finally, looking at some real world registry data, looking at the long-term risks. So first I'm gonna tell you what a knockout mouse is. You might not be familiar with this concept, but it's basically a mouse where a gene has been removed or inactivated. So basically you knock out, you destroy one of the genes. And that loss of that gene provides you information about what that gene does normally. And so here's an example, a simple uh, um, picture, a picture showing us what this TYR gene does. So this is a mouse that has TYR gene that is normal. So we call it a wild type mouse. When you knock out that mouse, so the TYR gene is removed in this mouse, and you get an albino mouse. So that tells us that TYR is important for making color of skin and of the hair. When we look at cytokines specifically, we can knock out different components. We can knock out that cytokine initially, we can knock out the receptor, or we can knock out internal molecules. And then we can infect mice with the virus and determine what happens to them. Are they worse off? Are they better off? So first, uh, we'll look at anti-TNF, so anti-tumor necrosis factor. And so this is a paper in which they uh, knocked out TNF alpha in mice, then infected these mice with, you'll see here, murine hepatitis virus strain three. Now that is actually a coronavirus, and it's a, in the same family as SARS-CoV-2. So they knocked those out, infected these mice. I'm just gonna show you the picture right here, which is the most stark thing. So they looked at these mice and this is percentage survival. So these mice are dying from this. So if you look at the wild type here, this is in black, you see that initially the mice were infected, were doing fine, doing fine, and then boom, day five, they all died. If you knock out TNF alpha, or if you knock out the TNF alpha receptor, you infect the same mice, but only a few of them die. The majority of them survive. Now that tells us that TNF alpha actually contributes to the mortality of these mice that are infected with coronavirus. What about human coronavirus? Because you might be saying, well, this murine uh, hepatitis virus is not really the same as SARS virus. So they did the same thing and they looked at infecting mice with the human SARS coronavirus. Now, in these mice that does not cause death. Instead, what we looked at here was the percentage change in weight. So that's what the output is. So we'll look again at our wild type, which is in blue. So that gives us an idea of a normal mouse. So you infect them and they lose a lot of weight and then they regain it as they recover from the infection. If you knock out the TNF alpha receptor in purple here, the mice did not lose as much weight. So the virus did not affect them as much. And they, in fact, they recovered quicker and they had a better recovery afterwards. So the mouse data tells us that TNF maybe contributes to the uh, pathogenesis or making SARS-CoV-2 worse. And we see that same thing from the patient data from China. When we look at individual biologics and we look at the uh, rate of nasopharyngitis or upper respiratory tract infections, or serious infections in these patients. And so you'll see here, this is a common table that's shown for a lot of different treatments. In this case, we're looking at sertolizumab, which is an anti-TNF biologic. And here's placebo versus the two treatment arms. You can see that when we compare the placebo versus the treatment, there's basically very little difference. Here, nasopharyngitis, 12% in the placebo arm, 12% in the treatment, 12.6 in the treatment. When we look at upper respiratory tract infections, 7% in the placebo, 4.9 in the treatment, 6.7 in the treatment. So even lower rates in the treatment arm. So that tells us that based on the studies, there's not an increased risk of viral and upper respiratory tract infections in these patients. So when we uh, summarized all the data uh, for all these different treatments, we created a, um, a pictorial uh, diagram to assess the risk. And what we state is that the biologics over here are all in the very safe zone of treatment. Down here in red, these are probably the treatments you want to stop. What about the non-biologics? Some of you may be on methotrexate or cyclosporin or premolast. 
So there are studies that were done looking at the treatment of psoriasis. So this is the MTOP study uh, using methotrexate. And as you can see, that same table that I showed you for sertilizumab occurs here. When we focus on infections, so here's the methotrexate group, here's the placebo group. You can see any infection, 44% in the methotrexate group, 45% in the placebo group, severe infections, zero in the methotrexate group, uh, only one in the placebo group, so very similar. So that is very reassuring from the study. When we look at individual nasopharyngitis and influenza, the methotrexate group right here versus the placebo group had very similar rates. What about cyclosporin? Then you have to go way back to 1991 to look for the study where they studied cyclosporin for psoriasis. Here, you'll note that, again, this is the placebo group. This is the cyclosporin treatment group. So about 4% uh, at three milligram dose had uh, an infection, 10 at the five milligram and 20% at the 7.5. So at the higher dose of cyclosporin, we perhaps see a little bit more infection than we do in the placebo. But at the normal doses that we use cyclosporin in normally for psoriasis patients, it seems to be quite safe. So when we assess this on the risk uh, parameter here, a premolast appears to be very safe. Methotrexate appears to be very safe. And cyclosporin, yes, there's maybe a slight concern, so we're gonna move it a little bit over, make it slightly yellow, but still relatively safe at the doses that we're using. When we look at the individual clinical trials that are being done to treat COVID-19, we see that there are now, we look at this clinicaltrials.gov where you have to register your trials. There are now over 3,176 trials being done. Uh, for COVID-19. When we look at the individual drugs that are being used, you'll note that a lot of them are anti-inflammatory medications. Methotrexate is being studied, cyclosporin is being studied, adalimumab is being studied. So there's lots of anti-inflammatory medications that are used to treat psoriasis that are being used to potentially treat SARS-CoV-2. What about the real-time data? Um, so there's lots of papers that have now been published since this has been now six months since we're in this pandemic. So you can see here, SARS-CoV-2 infection and psoriatic patients treated with uh, IL-17 inhibitor, uh, uzelkumab treatment, here's a TNF-alpha inhibitor, a Tanercept, um, here's an IL-23 inhibitor that was studied, secutinumab, mycophenolate. So lots of different case reports now have been uh, produced looking at patients who have become infected and most, if not all of them, state that patients have a better outcome when they're on these anti-inflammatory medications. This was uh, published in April. This is one of the first um, cohort reports from Italy, again, from the, the initial hot zone in Europe. Um, and I'm just gonna show you that they had a total of 1,193 patients uh, in this cohort. You can see that a lot of them were on TNF-alpha inhibitors, IL-1223 inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, IL-23 inhibitors, um, and then some of them were on uh, small molecules like a premolast. And, and if you look at the outcome, uh, no, zero patients in this cohort uh, died. Five were hospitalized. The vast majority of patients were very healthy. And what they state in their analysis is that yes, maybe patients are at higher risk of testing positive for COVID-19, right here, but the risks of being admitted to the ICU and of dying were statistically not different or lower. This is a paper that was published for IBD, so patients who have inflammatory bowel disease use many of the same medications we use in psoriasis. And this is where the patients were derived from. So this is a much larger study from many different centers around the world. So this world map depicts where patients were derived. Um, and they then identified um, if these patients were admitted to the ICU, if they were hospitalized, and if they died. And as we uh, see over here, they had quite a number of patients enrolled. So 525 patients, 3% um, died, 5% uh, were in the ICU, 31% were hospitalized. And as we saw earlier on, age seems to be a very important factor in determining mortality. So when you look at patients who are 80 or older, down here, 26% of those patients died, none when they were 20 to 29. 
When we look at the different treatments that these patients get, I'm going to focus on a few things here. So steroids, uh, um, hopefully no psoriasis patients are on systemic steroids. Topical steroids are okay. Systemic steroids, you can see the death rate here is 11%. That's quite high. If you look at patients who were treated with methotrexate or with a TNF inhibitor, or zero or 1% of those patients um, died. So a very low number. They also looked at IL-1223 inhibitor, zero. None of those patients passed away. So then they were able to do an analysis and identify what the actual risks are associated with your treatment. Uh, so age, as we know, there is a risk associated with age. But if you were on a systemic steroid, there was a much higher risk. But if you're on a TNF-alpha inhibitor antagonist, you actually had a lower risk. So this is the odds ratio of hospitalization or death. And they had a much lower risk if they were on a biologic. So that confirms some of the original data that we saw um, and some of the uh, information I shared with you from the knockout mice. So in the last section, we're going to talk about vaccination. because Obviously, that is up and coming. So what are the implications for psoriasis patients? So this was taken at the end of August from the uh, coronavirus vaccine tracker. And, and you can see there's a, a quite a large number of vaccines in uh, trials right now. Two have been uh, um, used in limited amounts in China and in Russia, uh, none in North America at this point in time. The vast majority of the uh, vaccines that are of interest right now are currently in phase three trials. There's about nine vaccines that are in phase three trials. And just to uh, remind us all what the different phases of a vaccine trial are, the phase one is to assess safety. So this is where they're looking at, you know, will this vaccine cause any serious problems? Do, do patients die when they're exposed? Phase two is a, a very a quick and early look at effectiveness of treating disease. And both phase one and phase two data have been published. Uh, and so early on, it appears that the vaccines that have now gone to phase three trial do produce effective uh, protective antibodies uh, and do seem to limit the severity of disease. And then the big one, of course, is phase three trials. And as you note here, it says it can take years. Now, we are living in a very accelerated time, and trials are being moved through the system very quickly. Uh, so hopefully, these will be coming sooner than later. Uh, some early estimates were six to seven months uh, after starting the actual trial. So that is a very accelerated pace. Just to remind you again about the infectious pathway, um, and this is the SARS coronavirus. And at the end, what we're trying to do is produce these antibodies, right? And these antibodies bind to this spike protein here that allows the virus to enter the cell. So if we can bind that spike protein, we can prevent the virus from entering the cell and therefore no infection occurs. So that's the idea of a vaccine. There are currently eight different types or platforms of vaccines that are being used. There are classical types of platforms and then there's next generation platforms. Uh, I'll just sort of go through them and give you an idea about the risk. So in activated viruses, there are some phase three trials. Um, the risk to patients who are on immunotherapeutics, so these are patients who are being treated for their psoriasis. We did a, a, are, are writing a paper on this right now and hopefully submit it next little while. There is none to minimal risk. Um, the one that always comes up over and over again as a risk to patients who are perhaps on uh, immunosuppressive medications are live attenuated vaccines. And you can see here, there is minimal risk, I will say, overall. There are examples in history of patients who did have decreased immune systems and had quite severe reactions to attenuated live vaccines. Now, luckily, as you'll note here, none of those that are being studied are in phase three. This is preclinical trial data only. So it's unlikely that a live attenuated vaccine will be coming to market. The other ones that are coming to market, uh, uh, the ones that are well advanced, are non-replicating viral vectors. Uh, so none to minimal risk. Um, RNA, some people might have heard of this RNA virus. That's also in phase three right now. There is no risk. And then DNA virus where there is no risk of uh, to patients who are immunotherapeutics. We then wanted to look at individual treatments and the safety and efficacy of vaccines as they come out. So 
Here you'll see the different treatments for psoriasis listed. And then this is the vaccine. And we actually, in our paper, break this down based on the type of vaccine that will get approved. And we try to assess the risk to patients and the efficacy of the vaccine. So you'll see in color coding what the risks are. So green is no to minimal risk. Uh, slightly less greenish and slightly yellow is minimal. Yellow is low risk and red is high risk. When we look at the actual risk, you'll see that the vast majority of the treatments have minimal to no risk at all. Um, the only one that when we did our analysis had a low risk was methotrexate. So it's slightly higher risk than the others, uh, but as you know, methotrexate is an oral agent and it can be stopped quite easily. So as you'll see in my recommendations, patients who are on methotrexate, you can consider stopping the methotrexate while they're vaccinated and then restarting it afterwards. Now, what about the efficacy? You'll see here we've given the efficacy of the different uh, vaccine based on a plus minus scale. So if it's plus minus, that means the variable, variable antibody levels can be produced. If it's plus plus, then not a problem. So here is uh, the data when we looked at it, we sort of give you a summary. So uh, a premolast not gonna affect the uh, ability to produce protective antibodies. Cyclosporin methotrexate, there is uh, evidence to suggest that it might lower the ability to produce protective antibodies. Uh, the biologics um, all uh, are, are in plus or plus plus range. And so when we looked at the data, we made some conclusions and some guidance for patients going forward. So here's our suggestions for psoriasis patients and vaccination. So number one, consider stopping methotrexate and cyclosporin for one week prior to vaccination and for two weeks after vaccination. That's because it takes time for your body to produce those protective antibodies. So give your body some time to produce those uh, antibodies, and then you can always restart the treatment afterwards. A premolast is likely safe and doesn't impact the efficacy of vaccination, so you probably don't need to interrupt therapy. And then biologics, you shouldn't stop them because not only as you saw from the data, they're safe and uh, there's likely not a great impact on the ability to produce protective antibodies. But when you stop the biologics, you can get potential loss of efficacy when you restart them. And that's things like anti-drug antibodies that can be formed. And as you saw, the biologics definitely help you if you may get infected by the uh, coronavirus. We do suggest um, checking titers. So how, how high are your levels of protective antibodies after you've been vaccinated, uh, looking for immunity. So patients who are on therapy, you might want to have your titers checked, uh, and then they may need booster shots later on. Now we can see with the measles, mumps, and rubella, even people who don't have immunosuppressive uh, conditions or are on medications may still need booster shots later on. So to review um, things we've talked about tonight, I've given you a quick update on the status of COVID-19 in Canada. Um, I've given you an overview of the immunopathogenesis of COVID-19, showing you that inflammation is a key component of the damage uh, that COVID-19 causes. The risks of COVID-19 to patients with psoriasis is very low. Now, obviously, people who have psoriasis have comorbidities that might increase their risk. I've reviewed the data on immunosuppressive medication, biologics, immunomodulators, showing that there really isn't a high risk to patients. I've given you a quick overview of different treatments that are being evaluated. I've looked at some real world data that supports some of the things we state earlier on in the presentation. And then I've looked at vaccinations, and given some recommendations of what you should do uh, if you are on treatment uh, for your psoriasis and when a vaccine does get approved, what you consider doing. So with that, I wanna thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll take any questions, uh, perhaps now or after, we'll see. Uh, and I hope everyone is staying safe and staying positive during this very um, difficult time for our society in general. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kirchhoff. Um, that was a lot of great information and, and uh, very reassuring to see all of the research um, that you shared with us tonight. So um, I, I don't see any questions just yet on the chat. That doesn't mean that we won't get any as we continue. Um, so what, what I'll do is um, introduce our next speaker, Laura, and uh, encourage um, attendees to, if you have any questions, please do um, write them up in the chat box um, and we'll, we'll re re go back to Dr. Kirchhoff uh, 
after Laura's presentation. Um, it's my pleasure to turn uh, the presentation over to Laura, a um, CPN member who has um, lived with psoriasis for almost 40 years. And um, we're grateful to Laura for sharing her story to build hope and connection that motivates her to, to um, work with us. Um, and Laura, I think, will be a great um, addition to Dr. Kirchhoff's presentation because um, she's, she's lived through these last few months with psoriasis and, and has had some perspectives from um, with, with phototherapy, which was a, a treatment area that we didn't talk about too much. So we'll, we'll, uh, Laura will tell us about her experience with that. Uh, and then again, we'll open it up to questions for both of our speakers. So thank you again so much. Um, and Laura, over to you. Thank you, Antonella. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Laura, and I just wanted to share with you my story. Um, as Antonella mentioned, I've been living with plaque psoriasis since the age of five, so it is almost uh, 40 years. Uh, it's mainly on my scalp, arms, legs, and I would say that my knees and my elbows are the most stubborn areas, and I have like a few uh, scaly patches uh, on my legs. So as some of you might be able to relate with me, uh, growing up with psoriasis uh, wasn't easy emotionally and mentally. Because as you could imagine at such a young age, I didn't really understand what I had back in the day. And I was constantly labeled a child with a skin disease. I was feeling embarrassed. I didn't want to engage in activities with my friends that required me to expose my skin, which resulted in me constantly hiding behind my clothes, even if it was like in the middle of summer. And no one really understood um, what psoriasis was and automatically uh, they would think it was a contagious skin disease. But despite all of that, um, I must say I personally have been lucky. I have a great uh, family support system and I did have a great group of friends that were accepting of me and looked beyond uh, my skin. The thing is, is as I started entering my teen and adult years, I started having more self-confidence and that's when I started realizing that I wouldn't let psoriasis define me. And after numerous doctor's appointments and trying to get as much information as possible on the disease and finding a treatment that worked for me, I started to just focus less on my skin and accept who I was. Like I knew who my friends were, I knew they wouldn't judge me, and in some way I just wanted to ignore how psoriasis made me feel. So now what's my experience so far with psoriasis, you know, and then this pandemic that we're living? So as Antonella mentioned, um, I am following a treatment which is phototherapy and I have been doing it for the past four years. I'm fortunate because I do have a dermatologist uh, that has lamps at his clinics and is very close to my house, so I could easily go there during uh, a lunch break. And what's scary is that, as some of you uh, might know, is that once we stop treatment, our psoriasis has a tendency of kind of creeping uh, back, and sometimes we might end up in a flare-up. And as you know, stress is our worst enemy as well. So the big question I had throughout this whole uh, COVID-19 pandemic was, how will it affect me and my skin? So first and foremost, since the month of March, uh, my stress levels, as probably some of you as well, has jumped off the charts. And my constant fear was, am I at higher risk because I have an autoimmune disease? And what will happen to me if I get COVID? Like that's my biggest fear. So I immediately called uh, my family doctor and my dermatologist and we had a discussion and they both reassured me that I was in high risk strictly because of my precondition of psoriasis or my treatment. So that was very reassuring, but I still had to be careful obviously and follow the health guidelines uh, for staying safe. But I also had another fear, which was probably one of my biggest ones, was the fear of a major flare up because the clinic had closed, we weren't shut down, I wasn't able to go. And I was constantly worried that my few patches would grow to bigger ones and I would start getting new ones because that always seems to be the trend. So I felt at the same time that all the work that I had done to improve my skin was gonna go down the drain because I had to stop for therapy and I wasn't on any other treatment. So I kept thinking to myself, oh my God, it's gonna get so bad that it would take me even longer afterwards to see some even minimum improvement. And every day I constantly was examining my body to see if I was gonna get new spots. And some of you might be in the same uh, situation as me. 
But much to my surprise, uh, despite all the stress, the uncertainties, the fears about my psoriasis, you know, getting out of control, I did not have a major flare-up. Even though I had a lot of anxiety and I was anticipating that I would have one, it didn't happen. And when the clinic reopened in June, I didn't go for the main reason that I was very scared to return because of COVID-19, not only for my own health, but also for my family, because my husband does have cardiovascular disease and it is, and he is considered high risk. So I was also thinking for, you know, the safety and health of my family members. So what did I do uh, during this time when I didn't go for treatment? Well, it was summer, so it was great. The timing was good. Uh, we had warm weather, it was very sunny. So I would go for walks on a daily basis and I made sure that my arms and legs were exposed and that I had sunscreen. So I tried at least to get a minimum of 15 minutes of natural vitamin D because I knew it was the therapy I needed if I wasn't going to phototherapy. And in general, when I do expose myself to sunlight, my psoriasis does normally improve uh, during the summer. So I still went to my follow-up appointment in July and I asked my doctor, like, why didn't I have a flare-up? Because although I was happy, I couldn't understand because I was expecting to have one. And he said, it's probably, even though I was maybe stressed, it was a different kind of stress. I didn't have the hustle and bustle of everyday life. And that got me thinking, you know what? He's right. It's true things had changed since the pandemic. Uh, I was working from home. I wasn't stuck in traffic every day. And I didn't have that constant feeling that I was rushing and going places all the time. And another thing is, is that I started meditating and I started to get back into my exercise routine. So I guess even if I was worried about COVID-19, I was taking care of myself mentally and indirectly. That's what probably helped control my psoriasis. So going forward, what am I doing now? Well, I did start going back to phototherapy at the beginning of September. And I'll be very honest, although I know that, you know, the clinic is taking all necessary uh, measures to make sure that everything is clean and sterilized, I still have a fear every time I go there. And it's because I fear that a second wave of COVID-19 is on the rise because cases are increasing. And obviously with winter and flu season around the corner, I'm not sure if I will continue with phototherapy. And that also worries me in combination with COVID-19. And for myself, as some of you as well might experience the same, Winter weather is harsher on our skin. And for me, the lack of sunshine will definitely have an impact on my psoriasis. I won't have the option of sitting in the sun. I won't have the option of taking a vacation down south. And I've already noticed that I did get some new little spots that I did not have two weeks ago. So already that the temperature is changing, my psoriasis is changing as well. So I am planning on meeting with my dermatologist again before December so that we could take a look at the treatment options because I know that this time around, if I stop phototherapy, my results will not be the same and my psoriasis will creep back. So lastly, my advice to anyone who suffers from psoriasis, whether it's mild, moderate or chronic, is really pay attention to your skin. Talk to others in your network, people that understand you, people that might have the same condition, because you could get a lot of information that could be very inspiring to you, or there might be other treatment options that perhaps maybe you haven't considered that someone could explain what worked for them and what didn't. And at the same time, don't be shy to call your dermatologist. You know, they're the experts. And they could look with you to see what might be other treatment options that are best fitted for you. So we're not alone in this community. We're not the only ones suffering from this. And we should never be ashamed of our skin. And I truly believe by educating others about psoriasis, we can collectively spread more awareness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for um, taking us through that. I think you spoke to uh, and reflected on um, issues that are common for a lot of people and 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 I'm sure some people listening uh, could could relate to some of what you described and I wish you all the best with uh, going forward and figuring out uh, how, how to work together with your doctor to as we go into the fall um, I did miss a question so um, I will um, I will 
have a look and see um, if we can get the, the questions that I missed answered. Um, but also, I want to invite our French participants. Um, if, if you have a question um, over the next few minutes, we'll be we'll be taking questions and uh, anything that we don't get to answer, uh, I will try to uh, follow up on after this. Uh, event, so so we'll do our best to get to everyone's question. Um, but if you are on the French line and you do have a question, um, please press star one to unmute yourself, and the translator uh, will be able to relay any questions uh, to us um, so that we can uh, ask Dr. Kirchhoff and Laura uh, on your behalf. Um, but the question that I wanted I, to oh, I, speak go ahead. I speak French as well. Je parle français si les personnes qui veulent parler français. Well, that's perfect. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in that case, Laura can translate for Dr. <laughs> um, because that's the uh, only other way we could do it the other the other way around. But our first question um, is, were, this is, I guess, for Dr. Kirchhoff, were any of the patients in the study on immunomodulators slash methotrexate receiving flu vaccine when looking at percentage outcome for risk of influenza? No. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand. So the, the question is basically in the study when people are on methotrexate, during that study period, do people get vaccines as they normally would? Generally speaking, clinical trials are conducted to be uh, to have as few interfering factors as possible. Uh, and so uh, they would probably not have had uh, vaccinations during that period of time. Thank you so much. The next question um, as well for Dr. Kirchhoff. So um, this writer has been recommended a biologic as a treatment option um, uh, because phototherapy wait times are very long due to the setbacks from COVID-19. I've never tried a biologic drug, but my skin has become severe. Should I hold off or is this biologic drug considered safe to start during the pandemic? And, and they're talking about um, the Selvamab, but I think this is a general question and we, we are going to focus just generally on, on um, and not on specific treatments, um, especially because everyone is individualized and, and, and you do need to talk to your doctor, but I'll turn that to Dr. Kirchhoff for a general answer. Yeah. So. As you, I didn't, I didn't show all the data. So we actually went through every single um, treatment uh, and looked at uh, the same, same thing we just showed you with one of the uh, cytokines. We did for all the cytokines that are involved in treating psoriasis. So uh, gizelkumab is an IL-23 inhibitor, and there's other ones as well. Um, that also inhibit IL-23. And so when they looked at, at knockout mice, so if you knock out IL-23 and you infect them with coronavirus, there's basically either no difference or those mice did better. Same, same thing that we saw with the TNF knockout mice. So it appears that um, if you block IL-23, you may be protected against some of the, the bad uh, side effects of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what I tell my patients is that based on the data that we have, and obviously, Nobody knows for 100% certainty, but based on the data that we have and the information that we have and the stuff from the case reports and the registries, that there does not appear to be an increased risk to patients who are on biologics uh, and it's safe to continue and or start a biologic. So I have, I have definitely started biologics for patients who are on, who have had psoriasis during this pandemic uh, because as was mentioned, phototherapy was closed for a long period of time, uh, and lots of patients uh, had more severe disease and coming into a hospital environment. So in Ottawa, phototherapy is only available in hospital environments, um, is, is probably more risky than, than getting a biologic uh, at home. Thanks so okay. much. And Answer the question. I think so. And of course, everyone, um, you know, we're available uh, info at cpn-rcp.com. So, you know, this is an ongoing conversation and we welcome questions that we can maybe address in future sessions like this. Um, I did get a question from our French line, I, I think. Um, do you recommend getting a flu vaccine? Again, a specific question, the, the general answer, Dr. Kirchhoff, on, on flu vaccines. 
Yeah, so um, you want, I'll answer in English, I guess. Uh, there's two there's two types of flu vaccine. Um, and so the normal vaccine that you get an injection with is safe and, and everyone should get that no matter what treatment they're on. Um, that's an example of a non-live vaccine. Uh, and as you saw, the majority of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are, are non-live. There is one live uh, flu vaccine, but I don't think it's available in Canada anymore. Uh, and that was the one that you sprayed in your nose. And so um, there is a slight increased risk of those um, live attenuated vaccines with patients who are on immunosuppressive medications. And so just to be extremely safe, uh, we don't recommend that because there is a safer alternative available. So the injection uh, for the flu is not a problem and everyone should get that especially this year. Fantastic. Thank you for your perspective. And I'm just having a look and it looks like the next question was also a flu shot question that I believe was answered, but if, uh, if it wasn't, please add any, any uh, other information you'd, you'd like um, us to address. Um, so I, I, I do have a question, Dr. I guess, Dr. Kirchhoff and, and, and Laura, you can well, um, that I was asked prior to this event, actually, um, that may be important to people. But um, Dr. Kirchhoff, can you speak at all to um, masks? So, so we at, at CPN, we always encourage people to follow the guidelines of your, you know, your, your public health authority, um, and and the Canadian Dermatology Association also promotes the general guidelines: of hand washing, uh, wearing a mask, social distancing, and all of those things. Um, one of the questions that I received was about, is there any specification about what people with um, psoriasis or, or related comorbidities should be wearing out in public? Like, is, is, is a, you know, homemade mask enough? Or are, there, are you aware of any research or information that you could share uh, to reflect on that at all? Yeah, so um, there, there is data, and they have done some studies on uh, the efficacy of different mask types. Um, and basically, if you have a multi-layer cloth mask, so multi-layer cloth mask is the important thing, um, then that is effective, uh, and you can wear that out. Um, obviously, there's those blue or yellow surgical masks uh, that the hospital hands out, and those are effective as well. Um, and then the, the one that we heard a lot about were these N95 masks. Uh, and those are obviously very effective as well, but they create a seal on the face basically, um, and they, they block. And, and so each one has different characteristics. The, the thing I will say is that any mask is better than no mask. Uh, and then the three masks that I just mentioned, so multi-layer cloth mask, surgical mask, or the N95 mask, all of those are uh, effective. Um, and can be considered uh, to be more effective than, say, a bandana or a scarf. Um, so in regards to patients who have psoriasis, is there any special recommendations apart from what the public health tells us? Uh, no, uh, there's no, uh, as you saw, there was no increased risk uh, for patients who just have psoriasis alone. Uh, of contracting uh, SARS-CoV-2 or uh, getting severe symptoms with COVID-19. Um, so there's, you don't need to isolate differently or behave differently. Um, and as you saw from some of the data, people who are on treatments for psoriasis might even be protected from the worst outcomes of this disease. Um, so that should be reassuring, hopefully, to patients out there who are being treated for their psoriasis. So, uh, follow what the public health tells you. Uh, that changes obviously from province to province and location to location. Um, and I, I think then uh, they collect all the data and have a much better handle on that. But I don't know, what what do you do, uh, Laura? What uh, do you find? Uh, you um, I, I do have a few masks. I do have an N95 and I also have uh, the multi-layered uh, masks. Those are the ones that I normally wear when I go out. But I'm also very paranoid, so I've, I constantly carry hand sanitizer with me wherever I go. I've got bottles in my car, in my purse, and I wash my hands constantly, even if I'm home and I don't go out. It's just become a reflex now. So I try to just really be careful. And in my household, I'm the only one that will go out and do the groceries. So we limit how much exposure we have to the outside. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we stick with our little bubble of family and we're just being very, very cautious because for myself, and like I mentioned, I do have my husband who has cardiovascular disease. So it just, I find I had a little bit more pressure, you know, you want to kind of be extra safe, hmm. um, but I follow the more or less the, the guidelines. Great. And, and uh, before I go on to the next question, which segues very, very well, I just want to mention that on our website as well, we have links to all of the provincial um, sites, uh, government sites um, on COVID-19. So it's a quick way to find information if, uh, about psoriasis and, and then also general information that the, um, um, of your local health authority on our site. Um, and the, so the question about hand sanitizers did come up. Uh, working in healthcare, I'm finding the sanitizers are very hard on the hands. Any suggestions, anyone? And uh, and then the reply was um, any hand sanitizer that is not as harsh for psoriasis. And again, I turn that over to Dr. Kirchhoff and Laura both. Um, maybe starting with um, Laura, your perspectives and on on hand sanitizer. Well, I, I kind of have the same problem where my hands were getting dry. I don't have a lot of psoriasis on my hands, luckily. I just have a spot. But what I do is I moisturize a lot. Like I use um, a moisturizing cream that has no fragrance or anything, and that seems to help me. Thank you. Any other insights, Dr. Kirchhoff, on hand sanitizer? Uh, yeah, so there's, 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 there are hand sanitizers that contain moisturizers that are built into them now uh, these were much more available or, or readily available before the pandemic started but there's ones that actually had uh, uh, moisturizers built in so that when the alcohol evaporated you have moisturizer left on your hands and so those were quite good um, obviously uh, some of those are no longer available the, the, the things we have in the hospital are just basically pure liquid so they're the pure sanitizer and they it lack a lot of those moisturizing components as Laura mentioned, adding back that moisturizer at the end after sanitizing is key um, to keeping a hands uh, healthy. Um, the other thing that I recommend is is is, is um, using actually uh, very mild detergent and and water. So washing your hands uh, can sometimes be actually less uh, problematic than some sanitizers. Some sanitizers are very uh, alcohol based and drying. And they can be very irritating. And you can imagine if you have cracks and fissures in your hands, that's very painful. So for patients like that, I, re I do recommend a, a mild uh, bar soap, synthetic uh, uh, detergent bar soap, um, and just warm water. And then putting a moisturizer on afterwards. That is a, a better approach and likely won't cause as much discomfort. Okay, great. Thank you so, so much to you both. Um, I think that... All the questions. Oh, I, I have one more comment on hand sanitizer that um, um, to, to add on to that. Hand sanitizer, what is the percentage of ethanol appropriate slash different for those of us with psoriasis? Are there any differences, Dr. Kirchhoff, in terms of no, no, there's no differences. There's they're all they're they're similar and they all have been proven to have a certain level of disinfectant ability uh, based on the type of alcohol they're using. Uh, and so then the percentage has to change somewhat, but uh, they're all sort of standardized for that, for the killing ability of viruses and bacteria. So there's no difference for psoriasis patients. Just don't do the mistake that I did. I couldn't get my hands on any hand sanitizer for a while. It was sold out everywhere, but I found a bottle of um, alcohol that was at 90% that I put in a spray bottle, and that's what I was using to sanitize my hand. And let me tell you, it really dried out my hands a lot. Yep. So I won't recommend uh, anybody trying that. Well, Laura, I'm sure you're not the only one who's tried creative <laughs> things during the last yeah. few months to deal with all of the new, newness that we've all had to deal with. So thanks for the tip. Um, I, I will just before, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, uh, I do. I am getting a lot of. Um, I got to thank you and, and great information um, on the presentation. So, so that's great. Um, I do want to give the French participants another opportunity. Uh, if you have any questions on the French line, um, you do have to press star one to unmute yourself, and uh, and an agent will will introduce you to ask your questions. So, we we do have a few minutes left. So while I um, review uh, some of the information that I wanted to make sure people had before we wrap up. 
um, you're welcome to share any questions on the French line. Um, but I, I did just want to take a moment to thank you both so much for your presentations, um, for your time this evening. Um, I think this, this conversation will continue to have, so we, we will hopefully speak with you again uh, as we move forward and learn more and, and hopefully reach a, reach a point where we are having conversations about vaccines a little bit more seri seriously and, and imminently. Um, and I want to remind all of our, our listeners, thank you uh, so much for joining tonight. We do have two events coming up in October and November. If you're not signed up already, you can do that at cpn-rcp.com. Um, um, and these, these sessions will be available on our website in both English and French. Um, so, so the videos will be there. Um, and and Again, we encourage you to check out our website uh, because we will keep updating it with um, reputable resources that we follow um, around psoriasis and, uh, and COVID-19. So with that, I thank you so much again, and I will close the session for tonight. Thank you, Antonella. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, you too. <laughs>